Recent research has shown that creative people are more likely to cheat than their less creative counterparts. Participants in the study first completed creativity assessment questionnaires and then returned to the lab several days later for a series of tasks. One task was a multiple choice general knowledge test for which the participants circled their answers on the test sheet. Afterward, they were asked to transfer their answers to a bubble sheet for computer scoring. However, the experimenter admitted that the wrong bubble sheet had been copied so that the correct answers were still faintly visible. Thus, the participants had an opportunity to cheat and inflate their test scores. Higher scores were valuable because participants were paid based on the number of correct answers. However, the researchers had secretly coded the original tests and the bubble sheets so they could measure the degree of cheating for each participant. Assuming that the participants were divided into two groups based on their creativity scores, the following data are similar to the cheating scores obtained in the study. High creativity, there's a sample size of 27, a mean of 7.41, and a sum of squares equal to 749.5. For the low creativity group, we've got an N of 27, so the sample sizes are similar, or they're the same. We've got a mean of 4.78, and we've got a sum of squares equal to 830. Use a one-tail test with an alpha of 0.05 to determine whether these data are sufficient to conclude that high creativity people are more likely to cheat than people with lower levels of creativity. Step one, what are our hypotheses? Well, this time around, we have a directional hypothesis. We've got a one-tailed hypothesis, and it is hypothesized, uh, so it's often easier to start with your alternate and then figure out what your null is when you've got a directional hypothesis. So it is expected based on the question that high creativity people are going to have a higher score than low creativity people. So we're expecting that the population of high creativity people are going to have a higher score. They're going to be greater than the population of low creativity. Alternatively, we could write this as mu1 minus mu2. Mu1 is supposed to be bigger than mu2, um, and so this would be greater than zero. The null is mutually exclusive and exhaustive, so it is that mu1 would be less than or equal to mu2, or if we use this form, this way of writing it out, mu1 minus mu2 is less than or equal to zero. Step two, we need to find our critical values. For that, we need to find our degrees of freedom first. So our degrees of freedom is n1 plus n2 subtract 2, 27 plus 27 subtract 2, which is 52. With that, we can go to the back of the book. We can find our t-critical. And the closest value, we go to our statistical table, B2 in our textbook. The degrees of freedom, we either have 40 or we have 60. And we're always going to go with the lower degrees of freedom. So if we go across at, at the 40 and we read across, with a one tail 0.05, our T critical is 1.684. And it's only positive, it's not positive and negative because it's a one tail. We're only expecting an increase. If we find a decrease, we're gonna to have to fail to reject the null. So if we look at it, our value is over here Anything that falls out here is going to be significant. Anything that falls back here is going to be not significant. It's going to fail to reject the null here. Doesn't matter how big of a score or how small, I suppose, if it's a negative. 
how far away from the mean it is. If it's a negative, if it's in the opposite direction of what's expected, we're not going to reject the null. We're going to fail to reject the null. Step three, we need to calculate our test statistic. Now, because the sample sizes are the same, we could calculate our variances by taking our sum of squares, dividing by our degrees of freedom, and plug those directly into our estimated standard error. Alternatively, we can calculate the pooled variance and plug that in. That's what I'm going to do, um, but either will get you this, the correct answer because we've got the same sample sizes here. So if we do the pooled variance, our formula is the sum of squares 1 plus sum of squares 2 divided by degrees of freedom 1 plus degrees of freedom 2. So that's 749.5 plus 830 divided by 26 plus 26. That's degrees of freedom for this one plus the degrees of freedom over here. So that is 1,579.5 divided by 52, which is equal to 30.375. I'm now going to plug this value into my estimated standard error formula. So my formula for my estimated standard error is now under my cat because they know exactly where you need them to not be. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put my pooled variance, which was 30.375. So I'll, I'll give you the formula here. What you do is you, you put the pooled variance, divide by the degrees, the where is my formula? No, by n, by n1, plus the pooled variance divided by n2. Now that pooled variance, I just said it, let me find it again, was 30.375 divided by 27, plus 30.375 divided by 27, One point one two five plus one point one two five square root of two point two five, which is one point five. Now we can plug this into our t test. So t is equal to m one minus m two divided by the estimated standard error. Now the mean of group one was 7.41. Mean of group two was 4.78 divided by 1.5. Got 2.63 divided by 1.5. Oops, sorry for the shaking. That's the cat. So this is equal to 1.75. So what we're going to do now is, so that's our answer for step three. We need step four. Step four is that we compare this value to our critical value. Now our critical value, if you recall, was 1.684. And this value falls out here. So our decision is we're going to reject the null and accept the alternate. And our evidence is that our calculated value is larger than our critical value. So our interpretation is 
there is a significantly greater amount of cheating in the high creativity 